Susan? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's council meeting. <clears throat> welcome all that are here present with us today, and welcome all who are watching. Before we start our meeting, I'd ask Madam City Clerk Sue Richards to read the quotation for the week. Thank you, Mayor. Challenge yourself to make your life a masterpiece. Challenge yourself to join the ranks of those people who live according to their beliefs, who walk their talk. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. I'll call a third regular meeting of the Common Council of Order. Madam City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Bauman. Uh, excuse. Boren. Here. Berg. Here. Serta. Here. Davis. Here. Graf. Here. Hannah. Here. Kittleson. Excuse. Clyunas. Here. Manny. Here. Meyer. Here. Montemayor. Here. Radke. Here. Ryan. Here. Susha. Here. And Vanderweel. Here. Fourteen present. Quorum is present. It is time now to pledge our allegiance to this wonderful country we live in. Alderman Warren, would you please lead us, sir? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Alderman Bourne. Approval of the minutes, President Burke. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I move to dispense with the uh, reading of the minutes and uh, ask for approval as they are entered on the record. There's a motion and a second under discussion. There being none, all those in favor state aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries, minutes stand approved. Resignations, Attorney McLean. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, there's a letter dated April 25 to the mayor uh, from Alderman Dennis Bauman advising that uh, he's resigning his position as alder person and along with that he's resigning as citizen member of the International Committee. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Before I ask for a motion to accept and file, as you know, there's been quite a bit of talk uh, and interest shown on several individuals in the community that the, the council should consider calling a special election in instances where there's a, a vacancy. The statute has been amended. A statute governing this particular uh, issue has been amended at some point at the state level where it now allows the city council to either call for a special election or simply appoint uh, an individual, a citizen, a qualified citizen, to hold that position until the unexpired term. The choice is the, is the council's choice. What we've done in the past traditionally is just simply appoint. Uh, for the reason that there's cost involved, there's time involved, and in this instance, there's also not a lot of time left. And this uh, particular position goes up for election in April again. Uh, those are things that you need to consider. Uh, what, I, what, what I was going to do, unless the council wishes to do otherwise, is to ask uh, interested parties to submit their, their names uh, in the form of a letter of interest that they are interested in being considered by this common council for the appointment to, uh, to fill that unexpired term. Those people, those people who are interested, um, according to, to tradition, would then come before the council on the 15th. They would each have three minutes in which to present their case, and then the council would take a vote and appoint one individual to serve the unexpired term. That individual would not take office until the following, uh, until the first uh, Monday of June, which I believe is the fourth. And that's when the individual would be sworn in and actually take office and conduct himself as a, himself or herself as an alderman. Are there any questions <coughs> regarding that before we accept and file the resignation? 
President Berg. Uh, yes, thank you. Just a question on the uh, new law that enabled uh, uh, elections. My understanding is that the soonest the election could be held is with the gubernatorial election in November. Is that, is that correct? That, that is the correct. seat would then be vacant, really, until November, and then in uh, December, individuals could file for the next election? Right. Thank you. Uh, Attorney McLean. Thank you, President Burke. Attorney McLean. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, clarify that. Uh, I've got the statute here, and this just became effective April 12th, so it's very new. Uh, it, it, section 17.231A reads, in cities of the second class, which we are uh, by appointment, uh, excuse me, uh, that's for the office of mayor, uh, for the residue, and well, common council may, if a vacancy occurs before June 1 and the year preceding expiration of the term or of office, order a special election to fill a vacancy to be held on the Tuesday after the first Monday of November following the date of the order. A person so elected shall serve for the residue of the unexpired term. Uh, I, I guess when I first read, uh, there was another part that says, uh, appointment by the council for the residue of the unexpired term unless a special election is ordered, in which case the person appointed shall serve until the successor is elected and qualified, which uh, kind of sounds like you could do both. You could appoint and then elect, but uh, I misread that earlier today. That is in the office of mayor. Uh, I think you've got the option either of appointing to fill the unexpired term or ordering a special election. And so there would be a vacancy until that time, I think. Which would deprive the particular district of representation, Alderman Meyer. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just wanted to ask, what would it cost to have a separate election for this unexpired seat? Madam City Clerk. Um, Alderman Meyer, I did do a little bit of research. As we said, this is very new. It, it does have to happen at the November election. So we were already having an election, so there is no added cost as far as that goes. However, if there would be a required primary, two or more people were to vie for this position, we would be forced into a September primary. And the issue with the September primary, even though we are already having one, is that it is a nonpartisan office going on a partisan ballot. And that is going to be a challenging issue. I foresee that we would have to have two ballots. So the, the added cost will really be the second ballot with an aldermanic position on it for just District 3. So the cost is <clears throat> certainly not as huge as we would think if we were having a special election six weeks from now, for instance. Then we would have to be hiring <coughs> all of our poll workers. It is in conjunction with either the September and or the November election. I foresee the cost being just the ballot that we would have to produce separately because you can't have a nonpartisan position on a partisan ballot, especially in September. So that's what my judgment is on that, is that that's where the cost will come in. And also keep in mind that uh, the time between now and November was about six months that the district would be without representation. Alderman Born. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I checked with uh, Sue Richards uh, on Friday for some facts about the third district. There's uh, 2,889 people in the district and in the April election, 925 people voted. It was about 32%, which I thought was a pretty good percent for a, kind of, you might say, an off, uh, off main time election. Being that this is a rather new law that just went into effect April 12th, I think it would be important to try to get some input from the people of the third district. After all, this person is gonna be representing them. Uh, get some input from them whether they would like to have a special election or do it as it's been done in the past with just taking interested parties and then having the council select that person. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Boren. Alderman Ratke. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm trying to establish a timeline in my mind. If we would go with a special election, which would be the November election, that would put us swearing this party in the third Monday in November, which would be the last council meeting of that month. Following that last council meeting, of course, we've got the budget, which is a special meeting, but then right after that, maybe by two weeks or so, we'd have that same person, if they wanted to keep the office, would have to uh, take on nomination papers. Am I not correct in that? That's correct. Yes, yeah, so within two weeks of taking office, they'd have to take out papers to rerun 
So, I mean, I think it's just total foolishness to have a se separate election. Oh, thank you, Alderman Rector. Is there a strong consensus that we not appoint? Otherwise, we will proceed with the uh, traditional method. <coughs> Either are. Then we, I will announce that we will ask interested parties to submit their names to the mayor's office or the city clerk's office. Anyone who is interested in running for that district, and I believe it's District 3. District 3. And if there's a <coughs> doubt as to the boundaries of that district, uh, please call the city clerk and she will, she or one of her uh, staff will inform you what those boundaries are. And on the 15th, we will ask for those interested parties to, to address the council for up to three minutes, and then the council will vote. I'd ask for a motion to accept and file. There's a motion second to accept and file the resignation. Any discussion? There being none, all those in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion. One nay, motion carries. Resignation accepted. Mayor's appointments, Attorney McLean. Thank you, Your Honor. This is dated May 1st. I hereby submit the following appointment for your consideration. Alderman Richard Manny to be considered for appointment to the Charter Communications Refranchising Advisory Committee to fill the unexpired term of Alderman Dennis Bauman, whose term expires 4 07 signed by the Mayor. And I'd ask for uh, President Burke's uh, suspension of the rules if there's no objection. Correct. Yes, I move to accept and adopt the recommendation. And you're asking for a suspension. Is there any objection suspension? to suspension? There being none, okay, there's a motion to confirm. And the reason we need to confirm and suspend the, uh, the rules is because there's a meeting scheduled for tomorrow that had been posted already. Uh, Alderman Bauman, former Alderman Bauman, was the chairman. And uh, we need to have an aldermanic representative there. And Alderman Manny is a representative. Okay. I'd ask for a motion to confirm the appointment. So move confirmation. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion on that? All those in favor of state aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Appointment is confirmed. And Dieter Helm to be considered for appointment to the Mayor's International Committee to fill the unexpired term of Dennis Bauman. Her term expires 4-30-07. Signed by the Mayor. And that will lie over. That's it. Thank you, Attorney McLean. No, it's, oh, I'm sorry. Alderman Graf. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, with the appointment of Dieter Helm, I believe he lives outside of the city, and that was a reason he stepped down from the, um, from the International Committee, I think it was two years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't believe the rules allow us to appoint someone to the International Committee who lives outside the city. Okay. I believe you're correct. I wasn't aware that he lives outside the city. He had shown an interest to do that. Yes, Attorney McLean. Uh, Your Honor, uh, kind of winging it, but uh, I do recall when he moved outside the city, there was a, an amendment to the ordinance to permit somebody on the International Committee who resides within the Sheboygan Area School District to be a member. Uh, I'd have to check that tomorrow, but uh, you know, he may be eligible under that provision if, if he's still got the same address or whatever. It's a matter of just checking. Mm -hmm. If he's not eligible, he's not eligible. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman Groff. Next on the agenda was a proclamation recognizing Municipal Clerks Week. And please accept my apologies. My administrative secretary is on leave right now, and the proclamation was prepared, but we can't find it. So <laughs> we know where it's at, we just can't find it. Sounds like a Yogi Berra, right? But not having the proclamation, I still feel that we owe Adam City Clerk Sue Richards some gratitude, uh, extensive gratitude for the tremendous job that she does for the city of Sheboygan and for the, for the people of Sheboygan and for this common council. Madam City Clerk, thank you for your hard work and dedication and uh, we look forward to working with you for many, many years. Thank you. Thank you well, very that much. Was better than the proclamation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We will now have the public forum. Madam City Clerk. Okay. First on the list is Dan Verhasselt. <clears throat>
Dan, if you could step up to the mic here, please. Dan, can you give me your home address? 705 Fairway Drive. And you will have five minutes, sir. Thanks, so. Thank you, Your Honor, Alder Persons, for allowing me to speak here tonight. I'm here tonight to speak to you as Chairman of the Parks and Forestry Commission. It's a post I've held for the last nine months since the Park and Forestry Commission was reinstated. My goals are twofold. Basically, I want to give an activity report to the Council of what we've been up to for the last nine months since we've been reinstated, but also to inform new Council members who've just been recently elected of our activity and our existence, the framework of which we exist. On the topic of activity and progress, the 0506 year has been a fun, interesting, and it's been a big learning experience for most of us on the commission. It's a first time for a lot of us. And the commission hasn't been around a while. We've been dealing with many issues that affect the citizens here in the city of Sheboygan. Right out of the gate, we were hit with the dogs in the parks issue. Following that, the dogs on the beach issue. Uh, we touched a little bit on the seagull feeding issue. And we were heavily involved in the park preservation ordinance, which makes it very difficult to destroy a city park in the city of Sheboygan, which is an excellent, excellent revision and passage. Uh, we started discussions on a, building a new master park plan. And for those of you not knowing what that is, it's the Bible of which how the Parks Department operates. And it's a crucial element in getting federal grant money. So it's a very important piece of information. Currently, ours is 17 years old. A lot of information is missing. We've drafted a list of areas in need which is designed to help encourage citizen involvement in park beautification, small items like um, flower beds and so on. We started a subcommittee with the Kiwanis Park users groups, um, be it the JCs and so on, to investigate how we can improve the park. It uh, needs a little bit of work. And finally, we've been very supportive of various park improvements around the city, some of which have been 30 to 40 years coming, uh, namely, Coal Park, Sheridan Park, End Park, and Moose Parks. They're finally being made to a point where they're truly usable. Looking into the future a little bit, I really do believe we need to do something with the dogs in the city of Sheboygan, but we shouldn't just do anything, OK? Um, I'm glad the issue is coming back to park and forestry, believe it or not. It will be coming back to us after it's spent quite a bit of time with us. It gives us a chance as a 10-member commission to relook and I guess a look at some possibilities that we touched on lightly the first time, but we could probably look at a little bit tougher. And two of those possibilities could be fencing off the ash pits up on New Jersey Avenue. That's where I personally think we should go. I think we should fence it off. It's an area that can't be used. A lot of other cities have followed suit. They've taken old landfills, old dumps, old ash pits. They can't be built on. They're capped. And dog parks don't require any building on them, generally speaking. So it's a perfect marriage. I think that's what we should do. Number two, I think we need to spend the money and budget it for a new master park plan. It's not an inexpensive um, option, so it's something that needs, needs to be planned for. I think you'll realize once you see the grant money that we receive <coughs> by using that document, you'll agree that's money well worth spending. Number three, I think we need to study the expansion of our recreational park areas. Um, it's true we do have about 700 acres of parkland here in the city of Sheboygan. However, upon the last few months, we looked a little closer at that, and we don't have a lot of areas I mean, for what we have for sporting teams, whether it's softball, baseball, flag football, regular football, youth football, our park space for that is regular, roughly tight, and it's causing a lot of parks to get wore out. So I think we need to long-term, what's over the next five or seven years, study how we can expand park area for that type of activity. And lastly, number four, I think we need to work on neighborhood caretaking program. Um, and this is, again, it's a kind of a lighter weight program that how neighbors around parks can get involved with cleanliness, safety, and just generally reporting maintenance issues that need to be done on their neighborhood park. With park acreage being steady in the city and the number of park employees falling year after year over the years, we need to get citizens more involved. So I think this is a good idea. In summation, I hope that I've met my two goals of giving you a progress report and letting, us, letting you know how we exist and what our activity has been. I think it's a great, act, a great commission. It's citizen-based, and it provides input. It's critical in that it provides input to a standing committee of aldermen on public works. OK, so if you've recently campaigned or if you feel strongly about citizen input um, on park-related matters, please use this commission as much as possible on those type of issues. You'll find no better group to get a spirited input from than our group of 10 park commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> Next on the list is Bob Holland. <coughs> Good 
Bob, can you give me your home address, please? 638 Pine Tree Road. Is that in Sheboygan? It's Kohler. Kohler, okay. And you will have five minutes, sir. Okay. It's with great pleasure that I address the council this evening to speak about Sheboygan County Interfaith's organization's longest running program. SCIO has been offering the farmer's market to our community since 1993. From its humble beginnings of just a, f a handful of farmers some 14 years ago, the market has steadily grown each year to include over 50 vendors just this <coughs> past year. From its inception, the primary reason the market was begun was to assist the family farmers in our area to sell their products to members of our community in an open air marketplace. As the market grew, so did its scope of programming. Consistent with our mission of helping those in need, SCIO has partnered with the WIC program to establish a voucher program to get coupons to our society's most vulnerable, the poor. Women, infants, and children may redeem, redeem their vouchers at, fountain, at the farmer's market so they may improve their nutrition. Sheboygan County enjoys the second highest WIC coupon redemption rate in the entire state of Wisconsin. Over 60% of the vouchers distributed last year were redeemed compared to a state average of a mere 50%. In addition, through a separate partnership program with the state's Department of Agriculture, the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program was begun to offer vouchers to the elderly in Sheboygan County. Last year, vouchers were given to 215 of our county's elderly, all of which were redeemed at the market. The success of these two voucher programs can be attributed in large measure to the central location of our market at Fountain Park. The WIC office is located just across the street on 8th Street from the park and across 9th Street are several senior living units with an easy walking distance to the park. <coughs> Fountain Park is the ideal location as it is the gateway to downtown Sheboygan, the riverfront and the lakefront area. Downtown residents, business people and the elderly can simply walk over to the market. It is also easily accessible for the tourist looking for something to do in downtown Sheboygan. And the park is conveniently located along a bus route, making it easy for local residents. In many ways, the farmer's market offers the best of what our community has to offer. Not only is there a wide variety of products available for purchase, but look closely at the diversity of our vendors, lifetime residents, Hmong families, young and old alike, all working side by side. Look at the many people that frequent the market. Locals, tourists, WIC families, elderly, and downtown business people. It could be said that Fountain Park, the farmer's market at Fountain Park, is a melting pot for our community. What better location than the park to showcase Sheboygan's embrace of the diversity that exists within our community? The plaza area next to Mead Library and the water feature has been suggested as an alternative location. While this location has some visual appeal, it is woefully lacking in three key areas. One, adequate space for the 50 plus vendors that set up in the market. There isn't even enough space to accommodate half of our vendors at the library plaza. Lack of available parking. There's only four parking slots on, on 8th Street right in front of Sunlight Books. And lastly and most importantly, there's no place for the farmers to load or unload, no staging area in close enough proximity to the market. To replenish their tables, they'd have to park on the west side, walk over, back and forth all day long, making it very difficult for them to, to set up their business. It's a, it's a nice location for the customer, but it presents problems for the, for the farmers, the very people for whom the market was first established. In the spirit of cooperation, we were willing to move the market to the parking lot behind Yonkers, even though we knew this location was less than ideal itself. This site, however, was quickly dismissed for other reasons. In that same spirit of cooperation, we have met with city employees and members of the Public Works Committee to brainstorm ideas how to keep the market in Fountain Park, many of which will be discussed this Thursday at the Public Works Meeting. As an interfaith organization, SCIO is committed to building our community rather than dividing it. In an effort to foster a sense of community building, I would like to publicly offer any business owner in the downtown area the opportunity to promote their business at the farmer's market. 
we would be happy to put out flyers on the tables. So look at the farmer's market as a great marketing opportunity with the hundreds of visitors that walk through the park each week rather than a nuisance. In closing, the Common Council will soon have the opportunity to vote on a resolution that would keep the farmer's market in Fountain Park. I hope you'll give it your full support. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> and last on the list is Ernest Kepler. Kepler, can I hold on a second? Get your home address, please. Uh, 2533 Lakeshore Drive. 2533 Lakeshore. Good evening. My name is Ernest M. Kepler, and I am the president of the Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance. Before I begin, the Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance would like to publicly and officially thank Mayor Juan Perez for his strong stance of listening to the people and taxpayers of Sheboygan as expressed in a State of the City address of April 18, 2006. Without a doubt, the door to the mayor's office is always open, and more people than before are expressing their opinions, <clears throat> including here at the council chamber. Most important is the mayor's recognition of the strong voice of the people. Mayor Perez emphatically stated at least six times during his State of the City, no more, no more taxes. This is a direct reference to no more increase in property taxes. With that strong stance solidly in mind, and with the kind forthcoming efforts of this new Common Council, we look forward to a 2007 city budget without any increase over 2006, and hopefully a decrease. The Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance would like to take a positive stand, and therefore we are proposing the following. To the Honorable Mayor and Common Council of the City of Sheboygan, in pursuit of fiscal responsibility with accountability, the Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance is pleased requesting the Common Council of the City of Sheboygan to demonstrate execution of improved efficiency while reducing costs and maintaining an acceptable level of city services. For, for that reason, we submit the following to you for your consideration and appropriate action. Committee of the Whole. Please reinstate the Committee of the Hall as a standing committee to meet regularly during each month. Shared <coughs> Services and Cost. The Shared Services Committee to start meeting monthly with the mission to target savings by combining services, daily operations, functions, and items purchased with Sheboygan County. Examples, police and sheriff dispatch, vehicle maintenance, employee health care, and selected purchasing. <coughs> Outsourcing of services. Outsource services when and where possible. This generates an economic advantage for the city. Suggested initial target areas include tree trimming, garbage collection, upkeep of city parks and other city-owned properties, and parking meters enforcement. Staffing issues. This should be considered a top priority. Review and institute appropriate cost-saving action on the following. Number one. Review and adjust all city wages and salaries, job classifications, and benefits to be in line with the private sector. Reduce and eliminate city jobs positions. Combine duties into remaining jobs at no increase in pay or upgrading job classification. We suggest establishing a special study and recommendation commission that includes both older persons and private sector human resource directors and managers. Please note that the private sector has been going through this process for at least the last six years and continues to do so. Number two, it is felt city employees should, be, should live within the city limits. No grandfather clause. Give two years for employees who live outside of the city limits to relocate into the city. Number three, replace current legal advisory system. Basically eliminating the office of city attorney and evolve it into a corporate council private law firm system similar to that of Sheboygan County for substantial savings and improved efficiency. Last but not least, eliminate the stormwater fees now. 
Uh, out of the $1.5 million paid by the taxpayers for the purpose it was created to address, to our understanding, only $478,000 was spent for the storm sewers and laterals. In addition, $70,000 is paid to the water department to have the charge printed on the individual bills. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> That's it. <clears throat> thank you, Madam City Clerk, and thank you to the citizens who addressed the council tonight. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to make some, some comments uh, regarding the city code listening sessions, the small, uh, an idea regarding small business conference, uh, city project update, and just a few thoughts for the new council year. The city code listening sessions, we had five meetings that were scheduled, two in the evening, one in the afternoon, and two in the morning, and those were held between the month of April 11th and April 27th. We had, it wasn't a huge turnout. I, I take that to mean we're doing a good job. There were 26 citizens that attended, five different aldermen, and six staff that attended, and I, did, I do wanna thank the police department, the fire department, and city inspections department for their participation and these listening sessions. Their, their uh, presence there was very, very key. There were several valid issues brought forth. Most dealt with issues involving building inspection. You normally don't hear about a particular code or anything that, that uh, the alderman passes legislation until somebody gets a ticket. When somebody gets a ticket, then it comes forth. And those are mainly some of the issues that we dealt with. We dealt with the issues of the house numbers, the reflective numbers that are new. Uh, people understand that now, and they accept that, and they, they understand the, the value uh, as a safety measure to the community also. What I will do, nonetheless, is prepare a comprehensive report, as comprehensive as it can be, and submit that to the council for your review and consideration. And it will probably, if you'd like, refer it to a committee, and that committee can look at it and consider whether there's any amendments or changes that need to be made to the city code. One of the things that came out during this listening sessions is that the city code reflects the values, the interests, and the concerns of the citizens. All that's in there is what people want for this community. And the council, throughout the years, including this year, responds to their needs and concerns and brings forth legislation to deal with those concerns. So all that city code is, is what the people want for a better Sheboygan and for their, themselves and their children. And that was important because a lot of people felt that this book all of a sudden magically appeared and people are getting pounded with it. It, it doesn't happen that way. The control of that code lies exclusively in this council. The next item I'd like to talk a little bit about would be the Small Businesses Conference. I am putting together the conceptual framework for uh, either one or two <coughs> conferences that will invite local small business owners to these conferences so that we can address issues and concerns that they have. One of the most frustrating things for small business owners is to feel that they're being left out. There's a lot of economic development occurring in the community. Um, for the most part, the big Walmarts, the, the Best Buys, the, the Home Depots, uh, all these big businesses get a lot of attention. Uh, we're <coughs> hoping that we can come up with ideas where the small businesses who have been uh, the blood of Sheboygan for many, many years, that, that they're able to come forth to us and, and talk to us about how can, what is it that we can do to help them be successful in our community. And I invite all business owners, small business owners, to, to attend those, and the information will be forthcoming. City projects update. I wanted to talk to you a little bit, in particular when it deals with city projects, streets, because a lot of concern is being expressed that we have some pretty horrible streets, and quite frankly, I agree. It's time that we start addressing this. The problem with not addressing uh, the, the street maintenance and repair is that the further they fall behind, the worse they get and the more money it's going to cost you because trying to play catch up uh, on the street repair and improvement uh, just, just about costs twice as much money and twice as much time. So that's not something we want to fall back on and then try to catch up. 
what I wanted to do last year and follow through this year is to put together a plan that we can keep it consistent and consistently keep moving so that all our streets get the attention that they need. Uh, one of the complaints that I get from citizens is that we tend to repair the streets that are in the, the more affluent neighborhoods. Well, that's, that's going to stop if that's the case. We're going we're to address the streets that need repair. It doesn't matter who lives there. If the street needs repair, it's going to get repaired, and we're going to put it on schedule. I do want uh, Mr. Dave Bebo, the uh, Assistant Director of Public Works, to address this issue because he put together a really nice memo outlining all the things that we're doing now and some of the things that we have in mind. And I didn't want to take that credit because it's, it's just not me, but I wanted uh, Mr. Bebo, who prepared it, to, to inform the council. So if you would, sir, please step up. Better yet, I need a motion to open the floor to a non- Okay. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor, state aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, Mr. Bebo, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Common Council for allowing me to address you real quickly on basically our, our projects coming up for this, this construction season this year. Um, I couldn't agree more with what the mayor was saying. Uh, by delaying maintenance of our facilities, all we're doing is, is deferring the maintenance, which is actually increasing our, our, our long-term costs on, on reconstruction. Um, however, I can say that has changed this summer. We have a very aggressive program. Starting today, we started work on A Street, which is going to occur between Ontario Avenue and Michigan Avenue. This project will match basically what has been done in A Street, and that cost of that project is $1.5 million. Starting in June, we will be reconstructing Commerce Street between Pennsylvania Avenue and Indiana Avenue. They'll completely reconstruct that section and that cost of that project is $1.5 million to be completed in, in October later this year. Also starting in June is the concrete paving extension of Gateway Drive and Concord Drive in our Sheboygan Business Center in the south side of Sheboygan. That estimated cost on that project is $775,000. One area that we will have this, this year, which we haven't had for probably the past four years, is our asphalt paving program. Beginning in July, asphalt paving should begin on the residential streets. Union Avenue will be resurfaced with blacktop from South Business Drive to 11th Street. The cost of that section will be $126,000 approximately. New Jersey Avenue will also be resurfaced between 15th Street and New Jersey Avenue Bridge at a cost of $100,000. High Avenue from 7th Street to 12th Street will also be resurfaced at a cost of $210,000. 13th Street from Illinois Avenue to Wisconsin Avenue will be resurfaced with asphalt, repaired curb and gutter and street lighting for a total cost of $463,000. Self Business Drive will be um, resurfaced from Washington Avenue to Carmen Avenue, and that will include the bridge deck over, over the Union Pacific Railroad um, in that location, as well as Washington Avenue from South Business Drive westward to just west of 32nd Street. We're going to rubbleize that pavement, which is concrete right now, and resurface it with blacktop. It's what we did with Taylor Drive, I'd say around six, seven years ago. That cost of that project is one, a little over $1 million. The grand total for all these projects this summer is $5.5 million. Now, that's not all city resources. We're using some federal block grant monies, <clears throat> local road improvement from the state, as well as some TIF district financing where some of these projects are occurring. Also, a major reconstruction will be occurring at the intersection of Taylor Drive and Washington Avenue as part of the Walmart reconstruction. That whole section out there is funded totally by the Walmart Corporation. I guess lastly, I'd just like to finish this, that this summer we have a very <coughs> aggressive street repair program. We ask for your cooperation and understanding during this, this season. Uh, the department understands their concerns, wants to keep any disruptions during this construction season to a minimum. <coughs> lastly, we ask you for your cooperation to, to please obey the traffic signs and the speed limit signs within these construction zones because they are a very dangerous <coughs> place for our workers and we just want everyone to be safe. Thank you for your time. Hold on. Uh, Alderman Sushi, have a question? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and thank you for the update. Streets are not very glamorous, but I think we will all agree it's something that we need to stick money into. Um, 
I did receive a couple of calls recently in regards to 8th Street and 7th Street being closed simultaneously in the downtown area. And I was reassured that 7th Street will open up again on Wednesday. Is that correct? That, that's, that's correct. Yeah, that was a little unfortunate. It just happened to be that with that new condo project for the retirement home, it, it just simultaneously occurred the same day that A Street was starting. Thank you. And then the other question I have, I don't have the answer to. Um, at the intersection of 8th and Erie, the stoplights have come out and stop signs have temporarily gone up. Will stoplights be going back up or are you going to try to turn that into a four-way stop? At, at this point, the project calls for a four-way stop, similar to what we have at, uh, at Penn Avenue where we have the flashing red lights. That's what we're planning on it at, at Erie. However, there will be conduit and everything and, and ready to go for signals if they're warranted. Right now, the way the traffic is, that, that traffic signal there was a very borderline suspect intersection to be signalized. Hopefully, we're thinking that a four-way stop should be able to accommodate that. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Beeble, thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> and again, just want to reassure the council and the public that there is a lot of work that needs to be done. We're putting plans in place to do that, and eventually, we'll, there's going, a difference will be pretty visible. We'll, we'll be able to see that. I wanted to share a few thoughts with you for the new council year. Um, the first one would be regarding the citizens' budget process. Every one of you received an executive summary, including the media, received an executive summary. And the reason we gave you a copy of the executive summary is because <coughs> the entire report is 210 pages long. So it's, it's not a, a, a document that, that you that I would want to copy right off the bat. But if any alderman wants a copy, you by all means are entitled to that of the entire report. If some of you would like to share with each other, it'll save some, some money. If not, your, uh, your, your wishes will be, will be honored. But in the meantime, you do have a copy of the executive summary. And that gives you pretty much a synopsis, a summary of the entire um, the, uh, survey. As you will recall, we did. Uh, 16 listening sessions and then additional sessions throughout the, the community. We did one in each ward, two in each district. And then the second step was to put together a survey and go out and ask the people what they thought about the input that, uh, that was provided. What was, driving, what was driving this whole citizen budget process were two things. If you would turn to page three, the driving force is the city at this time has been spending more money than we get. And we have a budget deficit. When your expenditures are higher than your revenues, you have a gap. And that's called a deficit. And we need to address a deficit. We've addressed it in many, many ingenious ways. But the ingenuity is going to run out pretty soon. And we're just not going to have the money to address those gaps. We're going to have to get really serious about how we conduct business here. The other driving force was the second chart there, illustration, and that is that the city debt is very near the city debt limit. We cannot borrow any more money. We're, we're locked into that 3% that the council establishes a limit for itself, and rightfully so. We're, we're allowed to borrow 5% of our equalized value. At some point, somewhere, the council made a wonderful decision to limit themselves to 3%. And I believe that was the smartest decision they could have made. Now, council, we need to live within our means. Those are the two driving forces behind. We spend more money than we get, and we can't borrow anymore. So we are in a tough situation financially. If there's any questions regarding any of this, tomorrow I have scheduled a press conference at 1.30 a, uh, PM in my office, and then if enough people come, we'll have it here in city council chambers. The media has been invited to attend. Dr. Westfall, the, uh, the person responsible for this massive study, will be here to answer questions, and so will some of the volunteers that were part of that team uh, will be here to answer questions for the media, the aldermen, the public, anyone who wishes to, to ask any questions. I did share the executive summary briefly with the staff during our staff meeting today. I wanted to do that before before it goes out, and I wanted to share this report with the council before 
it goes out to the media. This is why you're getting it tonight. Obviously, the media can get a hold of it tonight. I believe you got a copy of that tonight. And that's where we're at now. The next step's going to be, any time you collect valuable information, what in the world do you do with it? And that's going to be the next step that I'm going to take. I will, I will probably ask the council to either appoint a committee or to designate some aldermanic representation and a committee that we can sit down and address this, this uh, results. I will also be meeting with the staff individually uh, and with my administrative assistant and going over some of these findings. Some of these findings may be interpreted as being negative. I, quite frankly, interpret them as positive because there are things in here that are perceptions. There are things in here that tell us there's something wrong with the city. Well, in reality, there isn't. They're just perceived to be wrong with the city. And it may require some orientation and some informational sessions on, on our part or my part to go into the community and connect with the community and explain what it is exactly we do. <coughs> the budget for the longest time has been a secret. And I don't mean a secret intentionally kept away from someone. It was just something that just happened magically and it just moved along and money got spent, money got brought in, and it just kept going in a cycle. I don't like that. I'd like for people to understand that a little better. And this is why I go out in the community and explain what this budget is all about. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them tomorrow, the, uh, press, uh, the press conference. If you're unable to attend, let me know. We can still make, uh, uh, hopefully, we'll ask Dr. Westfall and some of the volunteers to make themselves available to answer your questions individually or as a group also. There's also plans being prepared by my administrative assistant, uh, Susan Hart, to, to have either one or two or however many are necessary orientation sessions for the council for those new members, a new alderman, and the, the, the ones that came back. It'll give you an opportunity to get to meet the staff on a one-to-one -one basis, ask questions. Last year we prepared, I had prepared a big binder with all the department heads and the information that's pertinent to each of the departments and what they do, how much money they spend, how many, how many staff members they have, just a little bit about everything pertaining to each department. I think the aldermen that came back still have it, so those that don't, uh, just call my office and we'll prepare one for you so that you can have that ready when you do the orientations. The orientation uh, sessions are not mandatory. They're strictly optional. You can attend or not attend. It, it, it'll be up to you, but we will make them available, and we'd be glad to have you attend. And again, if you don't, then that's your discretion. We will move along. President Berg. Thank you, Your Honor. Agenda. Yeah, on the consent agenda, I would move to accept and file all our roles and accept and adopt all our seats. There's a motion and a second to accept the consent agenda under discussion. There being none, Madam uh, City Clerk, please call the roll. Oren. Aye. Berg. Aye. Serta. Aye. Davis. Aye. Graf. Aye. Hannah. Aye. Cliunis. Aye. Manny. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Radke. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Susha. Aye. And Vanderwill. Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carries. Communications and petitions, 3, 311 to be referred. Report of officers, 2. 312 by the city attorney submitting a report on the status of the request for a legal opinion from the attorney general's office concerning the legality of the employment contract between the city, city's library board and the library director, Sharon Winkle. President Berg. Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. I move to accept and file the communication. There's a motion, a second to accept and file under discussion. There being none, all those in favor state aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 313 by the city attorney submitted as a matter of record a copy of the decision of the state of Wisconsin Court of Appeals in the matter of English Manor Bed and Breakfast et al. versus City of Sheboygan and determining that all the city's uses of room tax dollars comported with the requirements of the room tax state statute. Oh, President Berg. Yes, uh, I also move to accept and file that communication. There's a motion and a second under discussion. There being none, all those in favor state aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 
Thank you. 314, by the city clerk, submitted a legal opinion from city attorney McLean regarding the hiring of Ms. Yolanda Groff, spouse of Alderman, Alder person Jim, James Groff, for the city's tourism coordinator position. President Byrne. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Your Honor. I'd also move to accept and file uh, that communication. There's a motion and a second to accept and file under discussion. President Byrne. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Just as a point of clarification, I believe that uh, previously you noted that this would be referred to the district attorney for action. And just to, to clarify uh, uh, how that changed to the city attorney uh, offering his opinion, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. I had, I had spoken to the council before that I was going to put together a chronological order of all the, the sequence of events that, that occurred in, in the process of hiring Ms. Yolanda Graff. And I, I did so, and I asked Attorney McLean to review that before it went to the district attorney. Um, attorney McLean suggested that perhaps he uh, be allowed to give the opinion instead of the, the, the district attorney being the district attorney is a very busy office, uh, for a lot of reasons, and it, we wouldn't want to get into the practice of every time there's a, a, a discrepancy or a, a concern of this nature that everything goes to the district attorney, and that's where it stands. I agreed with that. I agree with Attorney McLean that uh, he is in a, a, a very good position as our legal counsel to provide the counsel with a legal opinion regarding the hiring of Ms. Yolanda Graff, and as you can see, uh, Ms. Attorney McLean's finding was that there's absolutely nothing improper in the process. Does that suffice, President Burke? Thank you. Okay, then I will ask uh, to for a vote. All those in favor, state aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 315, by the city clerk, submitting a communication from the Wisconsin Department of Justice Public Integrity Unit, reviewing allegations made by Alderman Susha regarding the closing of a public road, North 21st Street, in exchange for a 5,000 donation made by Michael Muth, and stating that there was no indication that a crime was committed and that they will be discontinuing the preliminary investigation regarding Alderman Susha's accusations. President Byrne. Yes, thank you. And I also move to accept and file that document. Second. There's a motion and a second to accept and file under discussion. There being none, all those in favor state aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 316 to 336 to be referred. Resolutions introduced three, 337 by Alderman Graf, authorizing an application to the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources for financial aid under the stewardship local assistance programs. Alderman Graf. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd ask, I'd ask for suspension. Is there any objection to suspension? Please proceed. And with that, Your Honor, I would move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. There's a motion to second. Put 337 upon its passage under discussion. There being none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Burke. Aye. Serta. Aye. Davis. Aye. Graf. Aye. Hannah. Aye. Clionis. Aye. Manny. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Radke. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Susha. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. And Boren. Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carries. 338 by Alderman Graf. Authorizing the City of Sheboygan, Office of the Mayor, to submit an application to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for lead-based paint hazard control grant funds. Alderman Graf. Thank you, Your Honor. I would ask for a suspension on this document. Is there any objection to for, uh, suspension? Please proceed. Then, Your Honor, I would move that this resolution be also put upon its passage. There's a motion and a second to put the resolution upon its passage under discussion. There being none, Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Serta. Aye. Davis. Aye. Graf. Aye. Hannah. Aye. Clionis. Aye. Manny. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Radke. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Susha. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Boren. Aye. And Berg. Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carries. 339 by Alderman Clejunas authorizing the mayor to graciously accept an offer from the mayor of Esslingen stating that the city of Esslingen desires to pay the hotel bill for, of Mayor Perez and his wife for their night spent in, in Esslingen. Alderman Clay Junis, that old person. Your Honor, I ask for suspension of the rules for Resolution 339. Is there any uh, objection to suspension? There is none. Did, and you made a motion? I move it, um, that the resolution number 339 be put upon its passage. There's a motion and a second. Under discussion. President Byrne. 
Did you want to say something? Um, yes, Your Honor, just as a, a point of uh, clarification, I believe from reading the minutes of the International Committee that this was addressed in the International Committee. I did uh, contact uh, Dieter Helm, who's arranging uh, for the tour to uh, ensure that this donation was costed in, if you would, as a revenue and that the subsequent costs would be equalized uh, given that this was a contribution and that would be offset uh, if you would uh, on the, on the uh, uh, side of the cost and that that money would be a pass through then to the International Committee. Uh, Mr. Helm did not return my call, uh, okay. but uh, it would appear that this comes, was addressed in the International Committee with their recommendation. Thank you. And, and yes, it was. It was addressed by the uh, Mayor's International Committee. Alderman Vanderwilk, did you have a comment? No. Any more discussion? There being none, please call the roll. Davis? Aye. Graf? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Clyunas? Aye. Manny? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Radke? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Susha? Aye. Vanderwiel? Aye. Boren? Aye. Berg? Aye. And Serta? Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carries. 340 by Alderman Susha authorizing con contracting with outside legal counsel to represent Alderman Susha against potential criminal defamation charges filed by Police Chief Kirk. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Your Honor. I motion to uh, suspend the rules. Is there any objection to suspension of the rules? There being none, please proceed. I move the resolution be put upon its passage. Second, second. Uh, motion and second put the resolution upon its passage under discussion. Vice President Sarda. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I had spoken with Steve, um, City Attorney Steve McLean today concerning um, the Wisconsin state statutes in this matter. And Steve, if you would please give your interpretation. Attorney McLean. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, yes, Alderman, I looked at this uh, today. Uh, number one, the resolution talks about potential criminal defamation charges. Uh, <coughs> there are no uh, charges pending. The, uh, there's two statutes that address this subject basically of indemnification of city employees and city officers. Uh, <clears throat> the first is 895.46, that's state and political subdivisions thereof to pay judgments taken against officers. <clears throat> Subsection one thereof uh, <clears throat> says if the defendant in any action is a public officer and proceeded against in an official capacity or proceeded against as an individual because of acts committed while carrying out duties as an officer or employee, and the jury or the court finds that the defendant was acting with the scope of employment, the judgment as to damages and costs entered against the officer or employee in excess of any insurance applicable shall be paid by the state or political subdivision in which the defendant is an officer or employee. Uh, and then uh, skips down, regardless of the results of the litigation, the governmental unit, if it does not provide legal counsel to the defendant, officer, or employee, shall pay reasonable attorney fees and costs of defending the action unless it is found by the court or jury that the defendant officer or employee did not act within the scope of employment. <clears throat> the duty of a governmental unit provider pay for the provision of legal representation does not apply to the extent the applicable insurance provides that representation. Uh, then there's some mechanisms here for the officer or employee to provide notice uh, <clears throat> to the uh, <coughs> governmental entity, uh, failure to provide the notice uh, is a bar to recovery from the political subdivision of reasonable attorney fees and costs. The attorney fees and expenses shall not be recoverable if the state or political subdivision offers the officer or employee legal counsel and the offer is refused. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's the basic gist of that section. However, uh, that's statute's been interpreted by the courts uh, to only refer to civil proceedings and forfeitures. So in the case of Bablich and Bablich versus Lincoln County in 1978, uh, it was held not to apply to a, uh, a sheriff who was charged with a, <coughs> with a criminal offense. Uh, there's, there's one case that <clears throat> applied it to a forfeiture against a police officer. It's the famous seagull shooting case in Ashland where a uh, deputy sheriff shot a seagull and was charged with a city, <clears throat> or charged with a state uh, forfeiture. 
a DNR violation. Uh, the court in that case held that uh, the city of Ashland there did not provide a defense, but the court found that uh, the officer involved was entitled to attorney fees and costs for representation in that case. However, that case made it clear that that did not overrule the Bablich case, which made, which states again that the, uh, this, this indemnification provision does not apply if it's a criminal charge. So uh, in my view, there would be no entitlement to legal representation or defense costs uh, in the event that an alder person was charged with a crime. Uh, again, this, this, uh, the other important thing to note is uh, there has to be a, an action or special proceeding pending as opposed to some potential. So I think it's rather premature to be even uh, raising the issue, but uh, the statute as applied by the courts would not uh, authorize uh, reimbursement of legal fees or require representation by uh, the city. Uh, there's another statute, 895.35, expenses and actions against municipal and other officers. This is a, a discretionary statute and says whenever in any city, I'll <coughs> try to cut it short, uh, whenever in any city <coughs> charges of any kind are filed, or an action is brought against any officer thereof in the officer's official capacity, <clears throat> and such charges or such action is discontinued or dismissed, or such matter is determined favorably to such officer, or such officer is reinstated, or in the case such officer without fault of the officer's part is subject to a personal liability, such city may pay all reasonable expenses which such officer necessarily expended by reason thereof. So that's, the statute uses the term may. Such expenses may likewise be paid even though decided adversely to such officer where it appears from the certificate of the trial judge that the action involved the constitutionality of a statute not theretofore construed relating to the performance of the official duties of said officer. That same <coughs> Bablich and Bablich versus Lincoln County case from 1978 uh, also addressed that statute and held that Lincoln County had the option to refuse payment of its sheriff's criminal defense attorney fees. Uh, so again, that makes clear that that's a discretionary statute. And that, this one really comes into play sort of after the fact as to whether or not uh, the municipality in this case uh, may uh, reimburse the officer uh, for reasonable expenses incurred in the, uh, the defense of the matter. It primarily addresses the issue where uh, the, the matter is determined favorably uh, towards such officer. In other words, the, found not guilty uh, in a criminal context. Or again, if even where it's decided adversely to the officer where it, the case involved the constitutional, constitutionality of a statute that hadn't previously been interpreted by the courts. So those are the two provisions, I guess. Uh, my advice, my suggestion at this time is not to act on this. Uh, number one, it's premature in that uh, there are no pending criminal defamation charges that I'm aware of. Uh, and number two, there's no entitlement to legal counsel. So, but uh, uh, as far as reimbursement of expenses, that's discretionary on the part of the counsel. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Alderman Hanna. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I also feel it's premature for us to move ahead with this. Uh, we don't know if there's going to be any criminal lawsuit or not. And I think we should uh, defer until the specifics of what's going on uh, come to our attention at this juncture. Um, I don't think we have enough information to make that decision. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I too agree with uh, Alderman Hanna and with uh, City Attorney McLean. 
There are no charges pending at this time. There's been no charges filed. Uh, there's been no actions taken. Uh, it does seem <coughs> premature to authorize uh, funding for legal counsel when there are, there are, there's no charges pending. So uh, mm -hmm. I would uh, make a resolution at this time that this motion be filed. I'm sorry, you're making a motion to file. To file, yes, sir. Okay. And there was a second? No. Second. Under discussion on the motion to file, Alderman Meyer? No. Anybody else on the motion to file? Alderman Manny? Thank you. A uh, question for Mr. McLean, just to clarify for me, I believe I understand. <clears throat> this is deemed a criminal charge, if it comes. Uh, well, right. I, I would say if there are criminal charges filed, it would be obviously criminal, criminal in nature. Uh, I think it's premature to speculate what the DA might do with it, but you know his only jurisdiction is really criminal offenses. Uh, although you know there, I'm not sure if there's any sort of uh, forfeiture that could be imposed, and maybe that is what gets charged. The forfeiture would be analogous to the the case that the Seagull shooting case that I mentioned earlier. That that was a forfeiture action. Uh, the court analogized that more like a civil action than a criminal action, but uh, you know there are criminal forfeiture statutes. But uh, I would think that a criminal defamation, if that's going to be the charge, would be a crime as opposed to just a forfeiture. Thank you. And then a comment. Um, given the commentary talk in the background of this meeting, uh, this night's meeting, that there might be charges coming, I'm going to vote against the resolution to file. And if that is defeated, I will vote to or move to hold this document. Thank you. Alderman Meyer. Thank you, Your Honor. I would like to ask Attorney McLean what would be criminal that Alderman um, Shusha did. Um, I didn't hear any accusations. I heard that she was uncomfortable, as was I, with a lot of the coincidence involved with closing this road. There are a lot of details. It's not just this anonymous $5,000 for tasers. There were quite a few different things that went into this. That was just one of them that put up this flag of being uncomfortable. And I don't understand why that would be criminal. I don't believe that anybody was accused of anything. And as far as I know, this is America, and we have a thing called the Constitution. And in there, it says freedom of speech. And if we're not allowed to voice our opinions or to um, say our concerns about something, then why are we here? Then we might as well all just go home and let the department heads run the city. Alderman Meyer, I guess that's part of why uh... I think it's premature at this point. Uh, I'd be rather surprised that the district attorney would file any sort of criminal charges, frankly. Uh, you know, it's conceivable. It's within the realm of, you know, potential, I suppose. It's possible, but I would be rather surprised at that. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm saying one of the things that I'm saying is that this is premature. Uh, you know, if there are criminal charges filed, that'd be another issue. Uh, I think it's really putting the cart before the horse at this point to insinuate or to speculate that there are going to be criminal charges filed. Alderman Ratke. Thank you, Your Honor. There's one whereas in this resolution I'd like answered, um, if I could. It says the city attorney and mayor advised Chief Kirk that the issue was over and the case was closed. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Uh, because if that's the case, why are we even arguing this? Well, uh, I didn't uh, draft up this resolution. Alderman Susha did. Uh, I talked to Chief Kirk. I, number one, I've never seen what went to the state for the investigation that apparently came back without any findings. Number two, I haven't seen what went from uh, the chief's office to the district attorney. So I haven't seen any of that. Uh, I suggested that the chief may 
want to just drop it and not pursue anything to the DA. That's all I did. I didn't say the case was closed uh, or that the issue was over. I suggested to the chief he may not want to pursue it any further. He chose otherwise, so that's, uh, I guess that's what the reference is. That's, that was my comment. Okay, on the motion to file, please call the roll. <clears throat> Graf? Aye. Hannah? Aye. I'm sorry? Aye. Yes. Aye. Clayunas? Aye. Manny? No. Meyer? No. Montemayor? No. Radke? No. Ryan? Aye. Susha? Abstain. Vanderweel? Aye. Boren? Aye. Berg? Aye. Serta? Aye. And Davis? Aye. <coughs> Nine ayes, four noes, one abstain. Motion carries, 340 is filed. 341 to 342 lies over. 343 to 351 to be referred. Report of committee six. 352 to 354 to be referred. Report of committees 8, 355 by finance authorizing a transfer of appropriations in the 206 budget. Alden Graff. Thank you, Your Honor. I would move that the um, resolution be put upon its passage and the RC be accepted and placed on file. There is a motion and a second under discussion. There being none, please call the roll. Clayunas? Aye. Manny? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Radke? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Susha? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Boren? Aye. Berg? Aye. Serta? Aye. Davis? Aye. Graf? Aye. And Hannah? Aye. 14 ayes. Motion carries. Ordinances introduced 10, 356 lies over, 358 to be referred. Other matters authorized by law, 359 and RO by the Board of Water Commissioners submitting their report on the water utility for the first quarter, 206. President Byrd. Uh, yes, I would request that the uh, report be accepted, filed. Motion to accept and file, 359, under discussion. There being none, all those in favor state aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 360, an RC by finance recommending repealing and recreating section 58-38 of the municipal code relating to audit of vouchers for library expenditures and passing the substitute ordinance. Alderman Graff. Thank you, Your Honor. That along with 361, which is an RO by the library board um, president to whom was submitted a copy of RC 542-0506 and RC number 492-0506 by the Finance and the General Ordinance 103. I would move that the, um, the RC 360 be accepted and adopted and the substitute resolution be put upon its passage and that the RO 361 be accepted and, and placed on file. There's a motion, is there a second? Second, under discussion. There being none, please call the roll. Manny? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Radke? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Susha? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Boren? Aye. Berg? Aye. Serta? Aye. Davis? Aye. Graf? Aye. Hannah? Aye. And Clayunas? Aye. 14 ayes. M motion carries. We have other matters. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you make that motion. Only other one. matters? Attorney McLean. Uh, 362 is by the finance director treasurer submitting the Harbor Center Marina balance sheet from operations dated March 31 as submitted by Skipper Marine. That will be referred to Marina and Harbor Commission. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor state aye. aye. Stand adjourned. <laughs>